and welcome to the sanctuary message made plain a biblical study of the sanctuary and the meaning for god's last day people i am pastor kemar douglas and today's topic is the sanctuary and its furnishings the sanctuary and its furnishings Indeed, it's a pleasure that you could be here, that you could be watching, participating, whether here on Zoom or on YouTube. It's always a blessing when we come together, when we study God's word, when we indeed dive into what God has in store for all those who believe. And as we come, we know that God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will indeed guide us and direct us. And once again, that his name will be honored and glorified. I encourage you to share this message with others. Let them know that God's goodness, his grace and his mercy is there available. And that the sanctuary is the method by which God has chosen to somehow display the plan of salvation. So as you come, may we all benefit, may we all study, but above all, may we accept the blessing and the goodness of God as he has indeed promised that once we follow him, once we obey him, he will indeed lead, guide, and direct us. At this time, why don't you just bow your heads where you are as we go into this once again, another solemn message of the plan of salvation found within the sanctuary. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you once again for your benefits towards us. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, into your hands, we place once again our study. We ask that your Holy Spirit will indeed be with us, that you will guide us, and that you will help us along the path. May your name be honored and glorified. May we once again see glimpses of you and your truth. May your Holy Spirit lead, guide, and direct us. We thank you for who you are, for what you're doing, for being the great God that you are to us. And we ask that you'll continue to allow us to bask in your goodness as we learn about you, as we prepare for your second coming. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And uh, of course, the study is open to every single individual. You don't have to be an Adventist. We hope and trust that as God indeed shows us his plan of salvation, that all of us will indeed accept and grow to love him. We are looking at the sanctuary and its furnishing. The sanctuary and its furnishings. All right, let's dive in. There is so much to learn. Uh, there is a wealth of knowledge available within this study. So the sanctuary, its furniture, its rituals are rich in symbolism. The imagination, however, must be curved so that effort is not made to discover a symbolic truth in every single detail. While symbolism may be found, the integrity of the Old Testament must never be violated on the altar of fanciful interpretation. That is why when we share, when I talk, when we go through, I'm going to give you biblical passages to help validate what these symbols mean. And there are going to be some things that I will not speak about because I don't have a biblical text for what that may mean. So I'm going to focus on the rich benefits that we have in what has been revealed. And I think what has been revealed is indeed sufficient for our salvation. So there are six items of furniture with their respective accoutrements in the sanctuary, along with the veil, all right? So the veil will make seven. And this is important because oftentimes, when I say it's six, you might say, oh, six? Well, that's not God's number. Seven is God's number. Well, if we include the veil, which is actually a part of the tapestry of the sanctuary, it does amount to seven. And the, this is critical and important what this means. And I'm going to go through each and every one of them. Uh, if you think that you need to screenshot this page, 
uh, for an easy reference, you can go ahead and do so. This is the book of Exodus. Um, so just go ahead and if you want to just go through, that is quite fine. But we're going to actually pay attention to a lot of these symbolisms as we develop. All right. So this is just an overview. So you know that there are seven things there, six literal furniture and the veil making the part of a tapestry. So that makes it into seven. All right. So here we have um, the sanctuary for those who need a basic understanding of of what this is and what the sanctuary is all about. Um, once again, just a recap for those who are just watching for the very first time. Um, there's only one way into the sanctuary, only one gate, only one way. You can't enter from the side, you can't enter from the back, you have to enter from the front. You come in with your sacrifice, you offer your sacrifice by confessing your sin, killing the lamb, then you go back out, you are done. So the average person has nothing to do with the sanctuary except confessing their sins and going back home, being cleansed. Everything else from offering your sacrifices right here, going straight in is done by priests. And only the high priest is allowed to go into the most holy place, which is right here. The most holy place has only one thing in there, which is the Ark of the Covenant. This is the veil I was talking about. This is the altar of incense. This is the menorah. This is the table of shoe bread. This is the labor that they had to wash. And this is the altar of burnt offering. You may be saying, why did I go from in here and come back out? Because in scripture, that's exactly how the account is given. From the most important, the most valuable, till we get out on the outside, which is basically uh, if you want to call it lease of the item. And I'm using lease kind of loosely because everything in this sanctuary is important. I, when I say lease, I'm referring to the quality of the material that makes it up. And you're going to find out more uh, as we go through, as we dialogue a little bit more on this. All right. So when we look at the measurements, the sanctuary, the courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy or the holy of holies as is depicted measures 50 by 100 cubits okay uh, there were 60 supporting pillars um it was five cubits high so you couldn't look over um you couldn't look through you have to enter through the gates okay you have to enter through the gate and uh, the gate itself um was reckoned as it is here, um, 20 cubits wide. Um, the Holy of Holies was 10 cubits. The Holy Place was 20 cubits. And that is the dimensions. And of course, it's estimated that the difference between here, we don't have the measurement for where the labor was. We don't even know the size of the labor. Um, actually, that was never actually given in scripture. So we don't know exactly how big the labor was. Uh, we know that the bronze altar itself, the bronze altar um, was five cubits by five cubits by three cubits high. That's what we do know. We also know that the table of Schubert was two cubits by one cubit by 1.5 cubit. The golden altar was cubit was a square, cubit by cubit by cubit. All right. So we do know that. We have no reference for the menorah or the the lampstand, its dimensions. The Ark of the Covenant was 2.5 by 1.5 by 1.5 cubits. All right. The curtains themselves um, was badger skin, ram skin, and gold hair, and fine linen. And the 48 boards of shitty wood um, on the northwest, south, and east was 15 feet high, 25, 27 inches wide, and 4 inches thick. And this was important because you could not see through and you could not see over. It was the highest thing in the entire camp of the Israelites. You could see for a pretty long mile. It was pretty spectacular to see um, when you saw the sanctuary in its full flight. All right. Also, just to please note, a cubit is 1.5 feet. 
Well, please note where the gate was. The gate um, always is always pointing towards the east. And because the sun rises in the east, so when you come to the sanctuary, you turn your back on the sun, the sun god, because that was the god that was worshipped majorly at this time from antiquity. So you will come placing your back towards the sun and going to meet the true and living God. So you turn your back on paganism, you turn your back on custom, you turn your back on um, that which was not God. And of course, you go to see the true and living God. And this is the position um, that was entertained for the sanctuary at all times, always with the gate pointing towards the east, so that when you come, your back is towards the sun, the rising sun. For those who may want to ask, so why don't we build our churches this way? Um, it's not really that important in our time as it was for the Israelites when our, all around them, the practice of sun worship was pretty, pretty big. It's all around us today, but it's clothed in this little thing that persons don't realize that they're worshiping the sun. But back then, it was an open worship of the sun, and hence this was important. And if you read the book of um, Ezekiel, you will find several references to even persons coming to God's temple, and they will turn their back on God and face the east. They will face the rising sun, and that was an abomination in God's presence. All right, that being said, um, let us go into and dive a little bit more into what is there. So, before considering each item of furniture, the following general observations should be noted. Attention is first focused on the biblical text, the construction, the materials, and the placement. The writer moves in his account from the innermost of the to the outermost part of the sanctuary. The metals used, which are in descending value from the Holy of Holies to the court, at the very center of was the best gold that was used and an ordinary gold then silver and then lastly bronze so let's start with how biblical account starts this particular meaning they are of the covenant which is in the holy of holiest or the most holy all right so exodus 25 and verse 10 and they shall make an ark of shitty wood two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. All right, so God going through what these dimensions were, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shall make upon it a crown of gold round about. Notice the kind of metal used. This was pure gold. So the box itself was made out of shitting wood, a very durable hard wood, uh, very hard wood. Uh, if I would want to compare it to something here in Jamaica, we would say it's like mahogany. It was a very strong and sturdy wood. And uh, this wood was overlaid with pure gold. Okay? Inside and outside was overlaid with gold, and it had a crown of gold round about it. By the way, this, this metal, what was used, was garnered from when God delivered um, the people, the Jewish people, the Israelites from Egypt and the Exodus, they came out. When they came out, they came out with the gold from that territory because before they came out, they had to borrow or take the gold from their neighbors as they were leaving. And it was this gold that was used in the building up to the point where when this was being built, Moses had to stop the people from giving because they gave more than that much enough to build this particular sanctuary. So let's continue. Verse 12. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. And thou shalt make staff, shit in wood, and overlay them with gold. Notice that it didn't say pure gold, it says with gold. Okay? And thou shalt put the staffs into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. And the staff shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. So once this was done, the stars were left inside the rings. They were not pulled out. Okay? They were not pulled out. Good. All right? 
And uh, thou shalt put into the ark of the testimony, which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work, shall thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. So you're going to have two covering cherubs beaten out of gold, and they shall sit on the mercy seat at the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherubim on the one end and the other cherub on the other, and even the mercy seat shall he make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the face of the cherubims be, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put a testimony that I shall give thee. All right, which is the Ten Commandments. All right, so this is a depiction that we have of the Ark of the Covenant. All right, so the shooting was overlaid with gold. Now, this is the best image I could find because I'm the artist and I can't develop, so I have to use what's available to me, but there are some things I need to point out to you. All right, the first thing is this. Where's my cursor? Great. This gold piece right here was not what was intended. The entire um, sheet of wood, very strong wood, had to be overlaid with gold. Okay? The rings would be on the side of the arc. If you go back to the text again, let me just go back and I want to show you something. Let me just show you something. All right. So there it is. And thou shalt put the south into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne by them. So oftentimes when artists render the drawing, they render it as being here, the front or the back, if you want to call it that. Because when you have a box and the box has a lid and you open the box, you tend to open the box this way, this way, right? That's how we open the box. So if this is the lid, we open a box this way. Okay, now we don't normally make boxes and open them long way. We don't normally do this with a box. So because the text says on the sides, it would not be born at this end or that end. It would be born at this end and that end, which would have been the sides. And the reason for this is that when they're born, on the side as what God says it should be on the side. When the priest is carrying the ark, when they carry the ark, what will happen was that the distance from the ark is greater when it's born on the side than when it's born on the length. Okay, I hope it made a sense. I hope that makes sense for you to understand where I'm going with this. So it will be on the side, giving them a greater distance away from the ark. And that's why it should be born on the side. And notice it cannot be taken out. Once it was in, it had to be left in because that was the easiest way for them to just pick up the ark and move with it as they journeyed in their exodus. All right. That being said, pure gold inside, outside of the ark overlaid with gold, cherubims out of beaten gold on both ends, and they're on the mercy seat, and beneath the mercy seat is the Ten Commandments. Good. Then there's mercy. Then there are angels. Then there's a kind of glory. That is the idea of the ark. And remember, if you have your questions, you can place them in the comments here on Zoom, and we will definitely answer them at the end. We'll reason together. So I hope this makes sense. Um, this is the most important piece of furniture because of the symbolism wrought within this particular piece. The Agar Covenant means a lot. Let me just basically say a few of the things that will kind of help us to understand. Now, the Shekinah glory represented God himself. So God's glory, God's light, God's brightness was in the sanctuary representing him. 
the carrying cherubs is what normally happens because within God's kingdom, within heaven, angels uh, do surround. And I want to try and share with you some text uh, shortly. So angels do surround uh, the throne of God. And of course, they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's what they do. And they're there. So this is depicting the throne of God. God's throne rests on mercy. Therefore, he loves us. And mercy and grace is what he wants to give us. So therefore, his throne rests on mercy, hence the mercy seat. And that is why the symbolism in the sanctuary is so um, important to understand because that's how we can really truly get what God is trying to do for us. God is a merciful God. His, his throne rests on mercy. His throne is about mercy. And that mercy is being offered to you and to me. Now, inside of the ark is the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments, of course, as you hear Adventists say all the time, is the transcript of the character of God and the revelation of his will. And the reason why we say it that way is because the Ten Commandments born out what God expects of those who follow him, what God expects of his children. The Ten Commandments is God's basic requirement that every single believer in him must abide by. And it is indeed the foundation of his government, how he deals with us and the plan of salvation. And of course, God's laws are eternal. God doesn't change his ways or his laws as time goes on. He knows what is best. He's God. And therefore, it forms part of who he is. Um, the only thing I can say is that he would not need to say, thou shalt not kill, because why would we want to kill anything if we are in a peaceful environment? All right? But we actually respect the sanctity of life and what God has created for us. So with all that, we find encapsulated in the most holy place. Now, when we look, it might be known that there was nothing in the Ark of the Covenant save the two tables of stone. Okay? There was nothing else in the Ark except the two tables of stone. First Kings 8 verse 9 says, there was nothing in the Ark save the two tables of stone. So you see, I literally pulled that from the text. And I'm emphasizing it because there are some who believe that um, the manor and Abraham uh, that budded, it was inside of it. No, it wasn't. It was not there. So there was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came up out of the land of Egypt. So what happened to Abraham's rod that budded? The one, the rod that helped them to uh, perform the first miracles that showed um, Pharaoh that he should let God's people go. And what about the manna that represented God's blessing upon the Israelites as they journeyed to war in the wilderness? Where was that? Well, the pot of manna was laid up before the Lord, according to um, Exodus 16, verse 33, so it was before, and Aaron that butter was laid up before the testimony, Numbers 17 and verse 10. They were not placed inside the ark. And it's important that when we look at this, that you understand that in the plan of salvation, what is important is God's mercy, What's important is God's law or covenant or testimony or commandments. Um, the fact that he will feed us um, is there, manna, but it's not inside. It's on the outside. It was laid before. And uh, the fact that he will deliver us, um, Abraham brought up, bought it, is before the testimony. But the testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, is what is important. God's mercy and God's judgment, or the basis of the government, or the character of him, which is his Ten Commandments, especially as it relates to us and the plan of salvation. All right? So the ark was viewed as the throne or pedestal of God, and hence the visible sign of his presence, First Samuel 4 and verse 7. A uh, counterpoint can be seen in Jesus Christ, who is the Emmanuel, which being interpreted God with us. That's what it means. His name actually means that God is with us. 
this is important because there are some who believe that Christ is not really God. He is a, a God or a form of a God or a servant of God, if you want to put it that way, but he's not God. Christ's literal name, Emmanuel, which we don't normally call him by because we prefer the name Jesus Christ because it means the anointed one that saves us and that's what speaks to our salvation. He also was called Emmanuel, which literally means God with us. And that's what God wants to do. God wants to dwell with us. He wants to be with us. And that was born out in the sanctuary when the Shekinah glory was found in the most holy place because that's, God wants to be among us. So Jesus came among men to make God present and known, just like how the Shekinah glory was present in the Old Testament in the sanctuary where God was known to the people and therefore was present within their midst. So the walls of the most holy place were engraved with many angels representing the clouds of living angels surround the person of god in heaven exodus 26 verse 1 and first Kings 2 verse 29 bears this fact out so it was embroidered into the wall um, with gold thread to symbolize all these angels surrounding the throne of God. It was a spectacular and a beautiful thing. Um, the only thing is that only the high priests really got a chance to see it. The craftsmen who, skilled men who built it would have known what it looks like and they could describe it. Uh, but only the priest was able to view this, the high priest was able to view this once per year to see all that blurriness. And just imagine, just imagine, just, just open your mind just to, Picture yourself walking into the most holy place and there's this bright kind of glory. There's this golden, pure gold. There's this angel out of pure gold. And there's this golden thread all around of angels. Just imagine how beautiful that scene would have been. And just imagine now how beautiful heaven must be. You see, God wanted to provide a particular picture so that we would indeed long to be in his presence, to enjoy the beauty of heaven and to enjoy, of course, his beauty because he's God. He's a merciful God that loves us and cares for us. So as we leave the most holy place, we have to go through the veil. And I found this um, photo very telling because of the fact of how we see the staves because they were never taken out in this particular depiction. And notice that in this drawing, they actually placed the staff. Um, once again, this is a short end. It should have been placed longer. So that's why it's hard to find depictions. I don't draw, and I wish I had an artist who could draw, redraw these things so I can show you how um, it would really look. But I have to work with the artist impressions that we have. The veil that is available had a number of colors and it was also had a few little embroidery to it. So Exodus 26 verse 31 says, so we're going to remember that we're going from the most holy and we're stepping back now uh, into the holy place. But for us to go into the holy place, we need to first pass through the veil. Exodus 26 31 says, and thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen of cunning work. And the cherubim shall it be made. So angels were actually also etched into um, this veil. Okay, it was etched into this veil also. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shitting wood, overlaid it with gold, with their hooks shall be made of gold, and upon the four sockets of silver. So now is the first time that we are seeing a lesser material being used. So the sockets were made out of silver. But the shitting wood that held it up, the rod that held it up was overlaid with gold. And uh, the colors that were used, we'll go back to it again, blue, purple, scarlet, fine twine linen of cunning work um, that was used. And of course, the cherubims were made thereof. The cherubims were etched in with gold. All right. And thou shalt hang up on the veil under the tashes, and thou shalt may us bring it thither within the veil, the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. So the veil provided a division between these sections of the sanctuary. Now with that, we need to understand why the colors. 
So red or scarlet, Isaiah 1 verse 8 speaks to this, that the color of sin and salvation because we cannot get forgiveness without the blood. We need the blood for the remission of sin and therefore it is a symbol of salvation. Scarlet is important. It has always been a symbol of blood. It has always been that blood needs to be um, release not only release to be poured out in order for us to receive a cleansing we have that from adam and eve sin we had it throughout cain and abel we have had it throughout um before the flood we had it with moses uh, we had it with noah we had it up until the time of christ it was a symbol of the blood being spilled so that our sins could be forgiven the purple is the color of wealth or prosperity and that's why in the New Testament, when we find that we had Lydia, the color of purple, she was wealthy, she had her house, she could keep the apostles, she could have these nice things because she sell purple. Purple was very expensive to make, and therefore it was a symbol of wealth. So the wealthy, the royals, the kings, the queens, they're the ones who will basically wear purple. All right. Blue is the color that was there also and that was associated with the commandments of god in part of remembering them and the heavenly calling of those who had been chosen by god to be his people so blue is about obedience numbers 15 verse 38 to 40. now while this is not a revelation study i just need to mention um that within the description of the beasts and the scarlet beast and the one that sat on the beast and the false church. The false church had red, it had purple, and it had gold, but it had no blue. And that, that's the reason why in scripture they were depicted the way they were depicted and why I keep on saying that Revelation, John has a lot of Old Testament and sanctuary motif within his description. They had no blue because the scarlet beast of false church does not, does not keep God's commandment, doesn't worship God in the truest sense of what God requires. So they had no blue, even though they may have the wealth and they may have uh, uh, the idea of sin and salvation, they just don't have the respect to be obedient to God. If we are going to follow God, we have to be obedient to his way. And that's why we need the blue okay that's why the blue was in the veil all right so with that being said the veil or curtain separating the holy from the most holy places of the sanctuary was a great significance because it was this veil that tore at the moment jesus christ died on the cross matthew 27 51 mark 15 38 luke 23 45 symbolizing the sacrificial system and uh, the end, the need for the Levitical priesthood to meet it between man and God. So it ended all of that. And this is important. When I often tell persons that it was Christ's death on Calvary's cross that brought an end to the sacrificial system, even for those who did not believe in him. So the Jews still don't believe that Christ is the Messiah, that he is the chosen one, that he is the Christ. And uh, you may ask, well, how could they not when they have read the book of Isaiah? Uh, most times they skip over Isaiah that deals with Christ's suffering because they don't need they don't need to read that they don't want to read that about Christ's suffering and that he was bruised for our transgression they, they don't really want that so they skip over that chapter in Isaiah so even though they don't believe that Christ is God and that he was the savior of the world and that he died for our sins they don't believe all of that they don't offer sacrifices and they don't because of what Christ's death on Calvary's cross did on that fateful day. When he died and that veil was torn, they were able to look in and realize at the even oblation, the even sacrifice. Um, at a time when persons were gathering for that grand service before the Sabbath was ushered in, they saw no Shekinah glory, they saw no Ark of the Covenant, and they recognized that, why are we doing this anymore? If God's glory is no longer in the sanctuary, if his Shekinah is not there, if his Ark is not there, the mercy is not there, then why are we doing this? Now, another question that person sent to ask when we get to this point is, so where is the Ark? What happened to it? We don't know. We know that in scripture, the last time it was seen when it went down, I can't remember the stack space right now, but it left and it went down, it didn't come back up. Um, forgive me, my memory is just failing me at this point in time. 
But nobody knows what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Um, we just don't know. It's got lost, um, got hidden, got buried. We have no idea where it is. We just know that it left Israel, it went down, and it come back up. So that being said, the veil has a bit more significance than just ending the sacrificial system and the work of the Levites. It went a lot more. It went a step further. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 20, the veil represents the body of Jesus. So having therefore, brethren, the boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So here, just like how we looked at the first furniture and looked at our covenant and the throne of God and his foundation and that he's merciful and that his commandments still exist and, and we looked at the colors of obedience and blood and royalty, the veil is actually Jesus. So we are able by Christ by Christ's blood and his sacrifice, by this new and living way to go into God's presence, to enter through the veil, because we're entering through the sacrifice of Jesus. So Christ is the veil. The veil is Christ. In other words, we can only enter the very presence of God if we have Jesus. We have to go through him. There is no other way to be saved. There's no other name on the heaven where we can be saved but by Jesus. He is the only way. He is the veil. He's the only way that we can get into the very presence and to receive the mercy and to build on our obedience and to accept God's government. We have to go through Christ. He is the veil. And that's why I keep on saying that it's important we understand the science because a lot of uh, salvation is depicted in the symbolisms that are there within. That being said, the tearing of the veil symbolizes the death of the Lamb of God because he is the veil. So when he tore, basically we are tearing him, which now permits the believer in the atonement immediate access to the most holy place through the new high priest, Jesus Christ, the one and only mediator between God and man. So, of course, we know that he is our mediator. He is the veil. Now, right behind the veil is the altar of incense. Now, remember now, according to how the depiction of the sanctuary is written and how these furnishings flow, we move from the most holy veil into the holy place. In the holy place, the, we're coming out. We're going to first see the altar of incense. Now, let's go into that one. It's just 30 verse 1. And thou shalt make an altar of, to burn incense upon, of shitting wood, shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, a cubit the breadth thereof, the four square shall be it by two cubits shall be the height thereof, the horns thereof shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof, round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. Notice the use of pure gold because of what this altar will signify. You soon figure out why it had to be made this particular way. And the two golden rings which thou shalt make under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof, upon the two sides of it, shalt thou make it, and thou shalt be for a place for the staff to bear it with all. So it shall be used for the staff, and thou shalt make the staff of shit and wood and overlay them with gold. Notice that it didn't say that you must leave the staffs in this particular one. Okay? We're not left in it. They were there to bear it, but it was not left. In it. And that's because the size of the altar would have made it difficult if you had the styles in it for the priest to do his work. All right, so what is the significance? Incense was to be offered on this altar by the priest every evening and morning. Good, it's a symbol of prayer. Um, Psalm 141 verse 2, Revelation 8 verse 3 to 5, but Psalm 141 verse 2 says, let my prayer be set before thee as incense. 
and it signifies the ascending prayer of intercession and confession by the officiating priests and the believers, sweetened by the Holy Spirit. Now, this altar and incense, incense is actually a sweet smelling substance. Um, I know that in our culture here in Jamaica, we have a different view of, of incense, um, but some of the Rastafarians do bore out that when they burn the true incense, that what is really is just not the sensei, um, they do have this kind of nice sweet smell to it, all right? So there's this nice sweet smell to the incense that was being born here. And of course, it is basically the Holy Spirit bearing up our prayer um, to God, all right? So with that being said, um, did I say yes? Right, so the Holy Spirit bearing up our prayers to the Lord. So hence, this altar was a symbol of the priest interceding, prayers for the saints. Uh, of course, the Holy Spirit is the one that takes it up interprets it and brings it to God. All right, the menorah, the menorah, the lampstand, uh, beautifully made, intricately made. Um, you'll find the description given here. The only thing we don't have is the actual dimensions. It's believed, however, um, that it was pretty big and it stood on its own, all right, because no table was mentioned for it. And those, oh, by the way, this is the King James Version. The King James Version does have a problem with translation. And it does use this candlestick because that was primarily what was used by the Anglicans and the Catholics at the time. And therefore, they did not represent the true nature of the sanctuary. This should be represented as a lampstand. So thou shall make a lampstand of pure gold, of beaten work shall the lampstand be made. His shaft and its branches, his bowels, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, and three branches of the candlestick out one side, and three branches of the candlestick out the other side. Three bowels uh, made like unto almonds with a knot and a flower in one branch, and three bowels like almonds in the other branch, and a knot and a flower, so that in the six branches that come out of the candlesticks. And the candlesticks shall be four bowels made with like unto almonds with their knots and their flowers. And there shall be a knob under the two branches of the same, and a knob under the two branches of the same, and a knob under the two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceeded out of the candlestick, the lampstand. And their knobs and their branches shall be of the same. All of it shall be one beaten work of pure gold, one beaten work of pure gold. This is artesian work to the extreme. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, and they may give light over against it. So let me go back to what they were trying to depict when they said knobs, and there we go. So it is actually seven. So we have the bowl that will contain the oil, um, that which is normally olive oil, pure and un beaten. We had the main thing, branch that goes up. This is why that's seven. It says we have three on one side and three on the other side. Okay. So three on one side, three on the other side. So you end up with having seven across at the very top. And uh, you had the bowls at the very top. You had the flowers and you have the knobs. And then you had the bowls for right there. And of course the flowers and their knobs. And uh, basically, it was an intricate, well-designed um, manifest artwork out of one beaten goal. It was just beautiful to, to see, and it was an amazing design. Okay, so why all this? Why this lampstand? So just inside the holy place on the left side stood the golden menorah that had seven um, lampstand branches. They were not wax candles as we know them, but lamps fueled by pure olive oil. The olive oil in the lamp symbolized the whole spirit that illuminates the church. So the major part is to provide light, okay? And of course, Christ is the light of the world, but we do know that oil represents the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit does provide us with the means by which we can um, glow for God and shine the light of Jesus. So 
the priests trim the wicks daily by refilling the ball with oil so that the menorah would constantly be a source of light for the holy place. It doesn't go out. Okay? It was not allowed to out. When God lights something, it should remain lit. Therefore, they didn't allow it to go out. They would trim. The wick actually came from the priest's garments, um, their living garments, whenever. If they should swallow it, they couldn't wash it. That's of another study. They would have to um, use it, tear it up, and they would make the wicks. And this wick will keep on burning. They would trim it um, every single morning. They will fill the bowl with olive oil and it would feed the lamps and they would just burn. It was a beautiful work of art um, that God had done. And the reason why the light was allowed to burn and couldn't go out, because Christ said he was the light of the world. Christ's light does not burn out. It's always there. And the reason why I kept on saying the Holy Spirit is the one that gave the source of that light so that we can be light is because he also said in Matthew 5 verse 14, ye are the light of the world. So we are supposed to shine for God once we have come to accept him and serve him and be a part of his family. All right. The olive oil, as I said, in the lamp symbolizes the Holy Spirit that illuminates the church. The lamp is a symbol of the word as well. Psalm 119 verse 105. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. And of course, the Holy Spirit is the one that has made the word of God available to us. The table of shoebread. The table of shoebread. Now, Exodus 25, 23 says, And thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit thereof, thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereof to a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a, a handbreadth round about. And thou shalt make a golden crown of the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof, and over against the border shall the rings be for the places of the staff to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staff of Shittimut, and overlay them with gold, and the table may be borne with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and the spoons thereof, and the covers thereof, and the bowls thereof, and the cover with all of pure gold shalt thou make them. So not only we have the table of shoe bread, we also had dishes and spoons and covers and bowls. Good. And thou shalt set upon the table shoe bread before me always. Okay, it should always be there. So what we find um, that the 12 loaves of unleavened bread, Leviticus 24 verse 5, but we know there were 12 loaves. These 12 loaves were symbolic of Jesus, who is the bread of life, John 6, 35. The number 12 was signified the 12 tribes of Israel, and of course, later, the 12 apostles of Jesus, the disciples, then apostles, who were to feed God's people with the bread of life, which is also a symbol of the Bible, Matthew 4 and verse 4. So what we find in this rich imagery of all the furnishings within the, the holy place was the bread, the table, the cups, and all these symbolizing the fact that we need to feed on God and feed on his word and feed on his goodness and praise him for who he is and for what he has done. And then we had over on the other side. So the table shepherd was on the right on the left, so when you walk in, coming in from outside in the shubert on your right, the menorah on your left, the altar of incense is in front. So we have the word of God. We have witnessing our light of the world. Jesus Christ he is the light, but he shines through us so we can witness for him. And we have prayer. The three major things for salvation is depicted in the holy place. We need to pray. That's obvious. We need to pray. And sometimes we can't pray the way we ought. So we do need the Holy Spirit to help interpret the groanings of our hearts. We need to feed on the bread, which is God's word. We have to bask in him, feed on him, if we're going to be able to grow spiritually and to be strong. And we also need the light. We also need to be witnesses of God, but we also, before we can be witnesses, we need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, the oil, 
the olive oil. So within this little space, what we find is how a Christian should live after coming to know God. You have to pray, you have to intercede for others, you have to read the Bible, you have to feed on God, basically including the communion, and you have to witness by the power of the Holy Spirit. So within this small space is how the Christian should live. Now, notice in the most holy place is where God was and where God dwelt with his angels and Shekinah glory and mercy and the commandments and the veil is Christ that we have to come through. But in this space, what we're finding, though we have the Holy Spirit, um, though we have Jesus Christ, though we have the word of God, it is the space in which a Christian becomes mature in God. And that's what the richness of the holy place is. The most holy place is where God dwells. And uh, though God is profuse among the entire sanctuary message, the Christian's development is found in the holy place. But how does a Christian get into the holy place? We will soon explain that part of the plan of salvation, which is the labor. Now, we don't know how big this was. Um, we have no idea the dimensions. And uh, so I won't be able to share that with you and I won't speculate either, but it was big enough for them to wash their hands in. All right. And they'll also make a labor of brass. Notice the difference now of quality because we're now on the outside. We're now in the courtyard. Okay. We left the most holies, went into the holy place and now we're into the courtyard now and the material changes. Okay. We now have brass. Uh, there's an argument whether it was brass or bronze. I won't get into it because they are saying that a particular metal was not available at the time that Moses was um, doing this because it was a, 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 an amalgamation of a metal to make brass. But we won't dive into that per se. We're going to just render it based on the color that was there. And thou shalt make a labor of brass and his foot also of brass to wash with all. And thou shalt put in between the tabernacle, the congregation, the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. So we know that the labor was filled with water. For Aaron and his sons, the Levites, shall they wash their hands and their feet thereat. That gives you a little idea of how big this was. And when they go into the tabernacle congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. And when they come near to the altar of the minister to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. So notice they had to wash their hands and their feet because if they didn't wash their hands and their feet, they will die when they entered and came near to minister before the Lord. All right. So they had to wash. So what we know is that it was made from bronze. I said there was a debate between brass and bronze. Bronze would have been the most logical metal that they would have had at this time. All right, bronze mirrors. This basin was placed midway between the altar of burnt offering and the tabernacle. While no specific dimensions are given, it must have been fairly large. It was round in shape with a shallower bowl beneath it into which the used water would actually run. And uh, this imagery was for them to wash. So I earlier said to you, so how did the Christian get into the park to develop and to grow and eat of Christ and to witness and to have the Holy Spirit and to pray? they had to first go through a cleansing. They had to first be washed. And the imagery here is the idea of baptism. So the larva was, was used for washing, signifying the necessity of purity and cleansing in our approach to God. Thus representing baptism, we had to be washed. We can't have, expect to approach God if we have not been cleansed, if we have not been washed, if we have not been baptized. John 13 verse 10, it clearly says that we have to be born again if we're going to make it into God's kingdom. Um, there's no other way to enter in. We have to be baptized. It's just what God expects of those who follow him. And I know their friends say, oh, but I don't want to be baptized and I don't think it's important. And, uh, and they make all kinds of excuses why they can't and shouldn't and if and but and he and how. Um it's not the way of God. We need to be washed. Baptism is important. And not only is it important, we know that this is baptism because 
when when Christ was having the first communion, the last Passover, he literally washed their feet. All right, they would have washed their hands when they came in, but that was a tradition. But there was no one to wash their feet, and Christ washed their feet, and this was a part of it. And Christ explained to Peter in John 13, verse 10, that if he washes feet, he's clean with all. All right, this cleansing can only happen if you receive the initial cleansing of baptism, because at the communion, it's called a miniature baptism or a miniature cleansing. But we need the full cleansing that comes from God. So that was baptism. So what's left? Well, the last furniture has to be the altar of burnt offerings. All right, the altar of sacrifice, as it's commonly called. All right, so in Exodus 27, verse 1, it says, And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long, five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square. The height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. The horns shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with brass, bronze. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes and his shovels and his basins and his flesh hooks and his fire pans and all the vessels there unto thou shalt make of brass, bronze. Um, of course, many times we think about the altar, we don't think of um, having to move the meat around, but yes, I had to on that fire that burnt, so they had to have flesh hooks. And thou shalt make for it a grate for the network of brass, and upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof, and thou shalt put under it the compass of the altar beneath, and that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. This allow Good airflow, allow the ashes to fall so they could collect them at the bottom and dispose of it thereof. And thou shalt make the styles of the altar, styles of shittim wood, and overlay them with bronze. And the styles shall be put into the rings, and the styles shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow the board, shall thou make of it as it was showed thee in the mount, shall thou make it. So the hollow with boards, uh, is to allow the meshwork and the air to flow and of course dissipate the heat so that the shitty wood would not burn, though strong it may be. So the altar was actually made of Achaia wood and overlaid with uh, bronze and have likened the wood portion to the human works and the brass to Christ's works. Let me just go back to something for you. All right, so thou shalt made the altar of shitty wood. And uh, I mentioned here the word Achaia wood. Now, the word Achaia wood was um, as important to Jewish thought. This actually came not necessarily from an actual text. It came from Jewish tradition and what they had actually used in the makeup. Achaia wood is actually a derivative of um, shittim wood, but it was done in a particular fashion to allow it to be a little bit more um, heat resistant. So, um just trying to it was made from the Achaia tree of course and uh, it's basically the same as uh, the shittim wood that was used it was very very durable um Achaia and shittim are basically intertwined in terms of what they were so don't think it's a separate thing it's actually the same all right sorry i didn't finish the slide some of like in the wood portion of human works and the brass the Christ works all right, so we are human. Everything has been, you know, we are feeble. We should burn. And Christ literally prevents us from burning. All right, so human works versus Christ works. Christ prevents from burning, just like how the brass prevents the wood itself from burning. Just imagine you have built an altar out of wood. No matter how strong that wood may have been, it will still burn. And yet it did not burn. Why? Because it was overlaid with bronze we will not burn because we would have been overlaid with christ he will protect us so without the brass the wood frame would have been consumed by the fire during the burn of the offerings just as though we will be consumed by the lake of fire if we do not believe that christ's grace is sufficient to save us all right so for years the sides of the altar were smooth and shiny bronze, but number 16 described a rebellion that happened at Korah. And in confirming the leadership of Moses, God judged Korah and his followers and caused the ground to split and swallow up all the rebels of Korah. And then this is what happened. The Lord then commanded 
that the priests take the bronze incense centers held by Korah and his followers to hammer them flat and to cover the altar of burnt offering with them to be memorial of the children of Israel. So when Korah did his rebellion against Moses and caused all that to happen, God opened up and swallowed him and all that followed him. They had to beat flat with a hammer. And therefore it was not the artesian work that God had in place when it was first done. And that was in place on the side as a memorial. So anytime persons walk in to give their sacrifice to confess their sins, they will see that um, dimple hammered out um, incense censors and will remember, don't rebel against God. <laughs> it was that it was a fitting reminder don't rebel against god and it worked all right well to an extent because israel still kind of rebelled against god anyway but what god had intended was that they would have seen it as a reminder that this just should not do this um for the israelite and their people they did not go down that same path again at that time because they understood very well what it meant uh, but sometimes as generations come, generations forget what had gone before. And the same thing happens even with us today, even with the Adventist church, we tend to forget the artist work of those who had gone before and what foundation they have built and what they have learned and to avoid the same mistakes that they made at the time. Many of us, um, or at least some of us, uh, actually do make the same mistake that was made in the past by claiming that our forerunners knew more than we know today when our forerunners were simply trying to learn the truth and pass on that truth to us. We should build on the truth that has been repeated unto us and not to go back to make the same mistake of those in the past. All right? Experience is a great teacher but it's best not for you to experience it. Sometimes you need to learn from the experience of others, all right? And that's what this symbol was for. So the idea um, behind the Hebrew word for altar is essentially a killing place. We also have an altar. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat, Hebrews 13, verse 10. Our altar, our killing place, is the cross where Jesus died for our sins and we follow by dying unto self and then living for him. All right, the cross is our killing place. That's the altar. Galatians chapter two, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Therefore, uh, we need to recognize the benefits of the goodness of God. So let me kind of walk you uh, back through the symbols a little bit for you to fully understand where we are. Let me just stop share screen. I want to actually show you why the plan of salvation is immensely important to our well-being and to understand what God has done for us. Remember, this is the plan of salvation. So I've walked you through from inside the most holy place to outside. And now I need to kind of walk you back in. And I want to just show you what I mean. Let me just share screen again. All right, hold on, and let me just let right. Let me just share screen. All right, here we go. Let's walk you through the plan of salvation as according to the furnishings. All right, so we are sinners. We are outside. Good. We are out here. We need um, grace. We need salvation. We need the love of God. That's what we need, right? So we are outside, and we do need help. So this is where we are. Good. We then enter through, because Christ is the only way, we turn our backs on the sun and tradition and all that is and our ancestral worship and everything that is online. God, we turn our backs on all of that and we go to meet the true and living God. The first thing that has to happen is the confession of sins. 
and placing that sin on the lamb, which is Christ Jesus. And Christ was offered on the cross. All right, so we come and the cross is available. After the cross and the forgiveness of sin, we have to go to the labor. There must be baptism. So we are on the outside, we are sinners. We come on the inside, recognize that we are sinners and we need to accept Jesus. We confess our sins on the Lamb and it's offered so we can receive forgiveness. After we receive forgiveness, we have to be washed. We have to be baptized. After we have been washed, then we can now commence our journey into being a mature Christian. Good? By feeding on the word of God, by being filled with the Holy Spirit and being a witness, a light to the world. And of course, by prayer. Okay? That's how we develop as believers of God. Then we have the veil. And the veil, of course, is Christ. Good. And we want to move from here into the very presence of God. But the only way we can move into the presence of God is if we go through Christ. For Christ is the veil. We enter through his flesh. Ultimately, as sinners, what we want to do is to get into the presence of God. That's where we want to be. But for us to get into the presence of God, we have to go through the stages of salvation. We have to confess our sins on the Lamb. We have to wash and be baptized. We have to feed on God's word. We have to pray. Pray to the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to shine our light and be witnesses as we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And as we do this, ultimately, one day, when Christ shall return, we shall be ushered into the very throne room of God. Of course, where God's throne is, there is mercy, there is grace, and of course, there is his commandments. And therefore, we are bound to accept and follow the plan of salvation and allow God to minister unto us. That's why. The sanctuary is indeed a beautiful tapestry, a lovely depiction of the plan of salvation, even down to the furnishings that were placed in there. Seven in total to lead us and to show us the plan of salvation. And with that, my friend, as I always end, I end with Deuteronomy because I think Deuteronomy. And this particular passage is of utmost importance to us. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, and I have begged you to choose life. Choose Christ. Choose the plan of salvation. Choose the way of the Lord that we find in the sanctuary. Come to him, accept him, serve him, confess your sins, mm. be baptized, feed on the bread of life, pray, mm. shine your light, be a witness so that we can come into the very presence of God, knowing that God has mercy and grace for us. And of course, the foundation is obedience to his will, to his commandments. May we all do what God invites us and asks to do as to bring him all honor, all glory, and all praise. I want you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you that your way is in the sanctuary, the plan of salvation in picture form. We are grateful that we are able to understand the different little things that you have done, the intricacies, the type and the antitype, as we give you all glory and all praise. May we all follow the plan of salvation because we desire to enter into your presence. But we first must do as you have laid down, confess our sins, be born again, feed on you, shine our light and pray so that we can enter into your presence, ultimately 
in glory. Keep us true and keep us faithful. And for those who are not yet a part of your church, your remnant church, the Seventh Day Adventist Church, we pray that at the next opportune time, they will seek to be joined in baptism and be a part of the family of God. We thank you. We praise you and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you.